On the right is Lord Halifax, the doyen of the uh, British establishment, the Holy Fox, as his nickname was. And he was Chancellor of Oxford University. So he conferred the degree on, on the emperor here. And I want to just think about this for a few minutes. Because at the time, Lord Halifax, um, Angela dug out his speech, which is recorded in the Oxford Times and the Mail, yes? Uh, yeah. And he praised the Emperor's courage and wisdom for how he behaved in exile in Britain in the 1930s. Which was, uh, of course, right and interesting to say. But there's a big story behind this photograph, because these two men's lives were very intertwined and interwoven, especially during the 1930s. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And I've always been fascinated. What were they thinking? A penny for their thoughts? Or maybe a bird for their thoughts? Let's see. So I think there are three ways, really, in which the, this intersection took place. And I came across this when I uh, wrote a book about His Majesty's uh, exile in Britain, the Imperial Exile. And for that, I did a lot of research at the National Archives in Kew. And so I, looked, I saw a lot of cabinet papers, foreign office papers, minutes, about uh, how the British government approached the Emperor's stay in Britain. Uh, so the first is, of course, Halifax at the time of the Italian invasion of Ethiopia in October 1936, he was, funnily enough, Minister of War. Minister of War. Before that, he had a, quite a checkered career. He was actually Viceroy of India and negotiated with, uh, with Gandhi and everything else. But he was Minister of War. But a short time afterwards, he left. He became the leader of the Lords. Uh, but effectively became Deputy Foreign Minister to Anthony Eden. And um, he was part of the cabinet that took the decision when the Emperor left Ethiopia to come to speak to the League of Nations. Uh, he said he wanted to come to the UK. The British cabinet deliberated and said in the end he could come, but only if he brought a small retinue and he didn't engage in politics. Lord Halifax, along with many others, saw Italy as their old ally, they didn't want to upset Mussolini, they didn't want to drive him towards Hitler. So they were trying to keep Italy on board, if you, if you were. So although they knew the British public was very pro-Ethiopian and saw a uh, disgraceful uh, invasion, uh, British establishment were playing it cool. The uh, Emperor did make his speech to the League of Nations uh, in June 1936. He spoke, of course, about the dangers of appeasement. One day it's us, the next day maybe you. Lord Halifax, of course, has come to be seen as one of the sort of bastions of appeasement, certainly in the early, early days. Uh, of course, he went on a famous visit to meet Hitler in 1937, when he nearly mistook him for a footman, <coughs> of course, the war to start even earlier. And of course, he also went hunting with Goering, who he described as being a very attractive personality. The second intersection took place in 1938, in February, when Lord Halifax became foreign minister. Eden was pushed aside. Uh, Halifax pushed a much stronger pro-Italy policy. He thought that uh, the Ethiopian Patriots were, were losing and that Victor Emmanuel III should be recognized as the rightful head of state. He floated this idea. Of course, the emperor was totally opposed, as he would have been. And uh, so uh, what happened was that uh, uh, there was much debate, but by the end of the year, Italy was formally recognized as the rightful occupier of the Ethiopia. And as a byproduct of that, the emperor was deemed to be the ex-emperor, no longer head of state, which meant that in turn he was subject to British tax law and had to fill out an income tax form, which I've seen. It's there in that white guy in the field. The third intersection, probably the most important one, was in May 1940. Well, you probably know about this famous story when uh, Chamberlain gave up office as Prime Minister, and there was a discussion as to whether it would be Halifax who took over or Churchill. Now, stories about this are varied, and the truth will probably never be known, but it's clear that Halifax probably did have a chance to be Prime Minister and didn't take it, for various reasons, partly because he wasn't really thought hit, uh, Churchill would be a better warlike leader, which turned out to be the case. But it's a bit murky. But anyway, it was a very close-run thing. A lot of people, the British establishment wanted Halifax, not Churchill, who was seen as a bit of an eccentric uh, and a maverick. 
So he becomes, uh, uh, still carries on as foreign secretary. But then at the time, just a few weeks after this, the British army was encircled in Dunkirk. And many of the British establishment, including Lord Halifax, thought that this meant that Britain could not defeat Germany and they should sue for peace. And who should they use as the intermediary for peace? The Italian government, who was still neutral at that time. And this was a very uh, close-run thing. The debates about whether peace things should be done or not. And in the end, Churchill came out on top. Some people say that was Churchill's greatest victory. Not fighting on the beaches, not the Battle of Britain, not everything else, but to keep Britain in the war. So it makes you think, it's one of those great what-ifs. What if Lord Halifax had become Prime Minister, if he very nearly did? What happens then if he'd have done a peace deal with Germany through Italy, which he very nearly did? <laughs> and if that had ever happened, would the Emperor have ever got back to Ethiopia? So that's some of the story behind this, this photograph. Of course, uh, what clinched it, if Churchill came out on top in June 1940, Mussolini then declares war on Britain, so it's all out now in the open. And then, of course, the British cabinet is very keen, maybe, to say, oh, we can cooperate with the Emperor now, we can go back with him, or we can mobilize forces again. He challenges that, because that will help us in our North African sort of campaign. And so uh, the great story of the Emperor's escape from, in secret from Britain, but he was in Sudan for a while, but then as you know, he entered Addis Ababa, May 5th, 1941, five years to the day since the Italians left. Now after this, uh, the two paths of the men probably didn't cross much. Lord Halifax was eventually maneuvered out by uh, Churchill, and he became the ambassador to uh, the United States, where he did a lot of very good negotiating with Roosevelt. And of course, in 1944, the Emperor had that famous meeting with Roosevelt on the Great Bitter Lake, and really that sort of set him in train to be, have a much more pro-American foreign policy. Um, and who could blame him in a sense, <coughs> leave behind some, probably had enough of European diplomacy by then. And so, um, maybe it was safer, if they were chatting or not chatting here, maybe they, they talked about Broadway and baseball, it was a more easy, a safer topic of conversation rather than the 1930s. But I don't want to end on a, on a note of a little bit of cynicism, let's be positive, because I think you can interpret this event of conferring of the degree as really a, a way in which the British establishment was saying sorry to the Ethiopian people and to the Emperor for their sort of, uh, shall we say, hands off approach in the 1930s. Because not just did he get this uh, degree here, but also, uh, he was welcomed by the Queen at uh, the station in, in London. When he arrived in 1936, no foreign office, uh, anybody, no, no one really turned up at all. Uh, the route was changed. Um, the famous story of Halifax's mentor, Baldwin, uh, avoiding the Emperor in the House of Commons by hiding under a table in the tea room. He didn't want to talk with him. This time, Churchill's Prime Minister is there at the station. Uh, the Emperor makes a speech at Buckingham Palace, he makes a speech at the House of the Parliament, and of course, he's also made free man of Bath in 1954, on this trip where he was in exile, where I live, where Sean comes from as well. And I'm glad to say the people of Bath actually did support the Emperor during his time in the 30s, very much so, and the local government and everything else as well. So I think we can see, even maybe Lord Halifax's speech praising his courage and wisdom the British establishment was actually recognising and putting things straight. So I think that's a good positive note on which, which to end. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and now to continue the... But anyway, thank you very much. And uh, you will take us a little bit more of the, the journey of uh, Haile Selassie in Britain. Thank you very much and thank you for the invite to speak today. Uh, it's an honour to be here. Um, so um, I'm going to just give a quick brief introduction. Um, I'm going to show a film clip. I made a film 19 years ago now called Footsteps of the Emperor, which sets the scene of His Majesty um, coming into exile and then reaching Bath um, in exile. So I'll play about six minutes of that and then I'll continue talking after that. Um, but just to kind of set the tone really, I think that for me, the, the, the fascinating, the magical thing always that you can never take for granted is, you know, we're here 
to see the prominence and this, I say this individual, but this couple, this king and queen, this majesty and her emperor. Um, and for me, you know, look, you go back in history and check the lineage and see that, that magnificence and with her majesty as well. But then start to take those connections and see how it connects with not only in Bath, in Oxford, and you know, whenever I tell people, you know, yeah, his majesty lived in, lived in Bath, you know, they, what, you know, they can't get their heads around that magnificence. magnificence. So for me, even though, you know, with your master, but also as a scholar and working in history, that magical element can never be diminished. Really. So I just want to kind of just show that prominence. So I'm going to just play a clip now for six minutes, to be precise. And then. Two African car walking sticks, formerly belonging to an emperor, it's classy. Solomon of Israel is told in an ancient book called the Kebra Nagas, the glory of the kings. The ancestors of this relationship can be traced to the ancient empire of Ethiopia, also known as Abyssinia. For thousands of years, Ethiopia has been ruled by the descendants of this biblical dynasty, and his imperial majesty, Emperor Haile Selassie, is the last of his Solomonic kings. I am going to take you on a journey through a little known chapter in the life of this extraordinary emperor and explore how he became affectionately close to an ex-Roman city in England whilst at the same time being oppressed by Rome itself at home. <coughs> He certainly deserves to be remembered as not just the last, but one of the greatest of Ethiopia's emperors in the 2,000 years of its history. He was a member of a provincial royal family from Shoa, around Addis Ababa, but once he became emperor, he was every inch the emperor, and no one who saw him would ever be unaware of that. <laughs> In 1935, Ethiopia came under Italian attack and subsequent. It signified his respect for the dead. The numbers of the victims have been given valid, <coughs> but here you may see the validity of the reports of considerable casualties, and may warn with us the fact that these terrors should recur in a world which desires above all things peace. Until the philosophy which owned one race superior and another. Inferior is finally and permanently discredited and abandoned. Everywhere is war. It was really a project of Mussolini's fascist government. Italy had tried to conquer Ethiopia in the late 19th century and being roundly defeated by the Ethiopians at the Battle of Adwa in 1896. And so this remained a running sore in the Italian national memory, which the fascist government wanted to erase. Equally, Italy already colonized both the area to the north of Ethiopia, in Eritrea, and the area to the south, Somalia, and wanted to create a great Italian East African Empire that would bring the whole area together under Italian rule. Due to the brutality of Mussolini's occupation of his homeland, the emperor had no choice but to leave in exile to seek support for his people's plight in a foreign land. After much anguish and deliberation, Haile Selassie chose England as the base for the Ethiopian campaign. The emperor <coughs> sails out to England upon the island liner Orphan. And when he disembarks at Southampton, receives the friendliest of greetings. The stately gentleman who has so much of the world's sympathy with him in his misfortunes. He would like to thank the British people for their warm welcome and the hospitality which has been shown to him. 
believe the Emperor Haile Selassie came to Bath because of the political implications of staying in the city of London. If you remember at the time, uh, Britain was not at war with any of the countries of Europe, and certainly not with Italy. And therefore, it would have been politically embarrassing uh, to have a refugee from uh, an attack by Italy based in the capital of the United Kingdom. But I think the people of Bath recognized the honor that was being done for the city by him choosing to come to the West. I was six years old. Um, I remember my father taking me to Newbridge Hill to see the emperor. We got there and the children were there and our mums and dads and cheering and waving, not really knowing what an emperor looked like. Because to me, an emperor, I don't really see him in storybooks. So I didn't really know what an emperor was at all. I had no idea. But uh, great excitement, wonderful, you know, to you know, see a real life emperor. So that's what I was lovely. So hopefully that sets the scene. So understand the modern day impact of Henry Carlos Selassie living in Bath is an important state that His Majesty is viewed as deity by members of the Rastafari faith. So in that context, Fairfield is the house literally where God lived during arguably the most difficult time of his human transcendent life. The complexity of feelings towards the legacy of the history is summed up by a Rastafari priest, Rastafari Selassie. Um, in the film he says, it makes me sad and it makes me glad. This is Ras this is Rasbandeli. Yeah. It makes me sad and it makes me glad because the reason for his majesty to be here is through the sadness of his heart. That if the sadness never occurred, then the gladness of being here today would not occur. The gladness of the elderly being looked after here would not occur. And the gladness of the Rastafari having celebrations at Federal House would not occur. So many things are happening in Bath now. The love that we feel here today, that would not occur. So for that, while I'm sad, I am also glad. The notion that um, the memory a site holds and acts as a source of both pain and comfort in that balance positions Fairfield as what um, historian Oliver Telly at Bath's value refers to, she refers to it as a reluctant site of memory which is a seen or unseen space which owes its very existence to the brutal European colonial conquest. So significantly for Fairfield, it contains a narrative of both European colonial conquest in terms of what was happening in Ethiopia, but also with African liberation. As it was from Fairfield that the emperor orchestrated, the allies negotiated and joined, uh, for the allies who joined the fight for Ethiopia's liberation. So Otelli's notion of a reluctant site of memory um, is in context with, with the argument that black history is not actually, you know, it can be seen to be hidden and not promoted as much uh, in comparison with Eurocentric histories. So the irony that the emperor sought refuge in an Italian villa in a Roman city in England while being impressed but at home by, Mus <coughs> by Mussolini's Rome is not lost on many of the visitors of the house. Likewise, the fact that the emperor came to Bath because he was deemed to be too popular to stay in London. And at that time, the British government, as we heard, um, <coughs> Mussolini was not yet declared an enemy, um, and his pact with Hitler had not yet been established. So these layers and contradictions and insights on the global political history add potency to the idea of Fairfield as a reluctant site of memory, and highlight how one relatively small building can trigger and unlock uh, many stories on a local, national, and also on a global scale. Fairfield is a place comprised of many multiple stakeholders and communities of interest, and notably Bath senior citizens, local and global Ethiopian peasants, the Rastafari communities, and local residences and tourists. And it's the, these various prior knowledges and understandings and empathies of visitors to Fairfield that transform the property from a mere physical space to a place with meaning. 
Um, as a heritage site, it means different things to different people, and that's part of what we strive to balance uh, in the content of the house and also in the activities that take place. One of the practical complexities of Fairfield is that the site operates as a, day, as a working day centre for the elderly, so that gift that, that the emperor wanted for the property is still in operation. Um, and at the same time, it's also a spiritual and a, cult a cultural space that's open to the public. While this is not only the Rastafari that are interested in history and recognise its importance, it's undoubtedly Rastafari that have been the community that have most kept the name of Haile Selassie alive in public consciousness, especially through the works of Lege um, and also the Emperor's face used on various artefacts and tributes. So finally, um, last reflections, I'd just like to share a personal exploration of Fairfield House in the form of three capacities that the house served for the emperor, as it served as a family home, it served as a political base, and it served as a spiritual shelter. So as a, in a family context, the idea of family is important to Fairfield, with the balance of the different stakeholder groups involved, and working with the elders, the basic family tenets of love, unity, and respect are vital. And there is a responsibility to further the educational potential of the house, raising awareness not only of the emperor and his legacy, but also telling an expanded version of what gets presented as European history. For example, how what was going on in, in Africa, how that was central to what was happening in Europe, and our understanding of the World War, you know, we just sort of keep ex exploring that in a, in a really, um, you know, fascinating way. Um, and that was a lot of history that I was aware well, of, so, so that, that adds to what I'm saying here, that the stories that Fatou could unlock can actually deepen our understanding of European and, and British history. Political, I think one of the political dynamics and challenges of Fairfield House is having to is working with whichever colour political party leads the local council at any given time. Because um, the council wanted to sell off Fairfield, I should, I should stress that, you know, it's given as a gift to the city, but this, the council now deemed it too expensive to run, and they want to sell it off, or wanted to sell it off as a private concern, maybe to turn into flats, etc. So that's when we set up the charity at Fairfield to stop that happening. Um, so at the same time, we've got to stay true to the, 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 um, the committee's core values, Represented, representing the core values of the stakeholder groups. We also know that we have to communicate with the councils and you know, negotiate on that um, element as well. By nature of its history, Fairfield is, it has an activist story to tell, with the emperor's experiences of speaking truth to power in his famous League of Nations speech. He gave the rest of the city as a gift, um, and that is the gift that we are um, fighting tooth and nail to, to remain, not only for our generations, but for the generations to come. And the final reflection is the, the spiritual element of the house. Um, for Fairfield, one of the key spiritual dynamics is ensuring that the numerous holy days of both the Rastafari and the Ethiopian Orthodox calendars are open for those respective communities to feel safe, to celebrate, to pray, meditate and observe in the way that they see fit, whether individually or collectively. Um, His Majesty, there was an Ethiopian Orthodox chapel on the premises of Fairfield when His Majesty lived there. Um, it's no longer there, it's, it's kind of a greenhouse structure. Um, and there's lots of stories when people come back and, you know, with the family and also local residents talking about, you know, the, the, one of the sites of those, those religious um, events. Every first Saturday of the month is a Sabbath um, a current, uh, observation for the Rastafari community and we get visitors from all over the country and indeed from all over the world. Um, even if they know something's happening or not, they turn up sometimes on spec to see um, and it's always fan fantastic to welcome them. So the type that we walk is hosting the globally recognised spiritual dynamics of the house and respective faithful whilst at the same time remaining Kind of a secular non-denominational organisation. So please do visit us, visit the house where um, many say that God lived and all are welcome. So thank you very much. Thank you very much John for <laughs> launching us. Yeah. Our next speaker, Dr. Wendy Tadlister. I'm proud, thank you.
you and I'll try to explain um, how these words are contained in this map. Uh, this is a map I've been prepared by uh, probably French um, cartographers in uh, 1901, uh, taken from uh, Chronicles of Emperor Menefic, um, written by Dr. Sebastian and uh, the French of Barbados. And you can see um, when Emperor Menefic incorporated much of uh, <coughs> Eastern and Southern and Southwestern regions, these were the kind of uh, entities that were officially recognized. Uh, but there is much to this, um, and this map that's not short, uh, as you can see, the only the other areas have, uh, have not been marked by, uh, have not been marked by any clan or other um, entities uh, which had um, <coughs> royal or generational or other kinds of authority uh, within their own groups. So we see different kinds of um, royalties here, especially in the southwest. We have the Bajifa um, uh, uh, family of Kafa, uh, especially in Jima, and there are many small kingdoms, um, <coughs> 55 in the Gamu area, um, and um, territories in the Wolaita area where there are where seven main chiefs but under one king and um, the further you go out um, in Walaga you have the Jote family that's been married to the palace and uh, been part of the Ethiopian um, royalty and further up in Tigray and uh, the different um, entities here there's a number of them been a number of um, royalties um, well is one example where Emperor Empress Menon, the wife of um, King Mikhail, was married to Emperor Haile Selassie, and from part of the, the, the core of the Ethiopian royal family. Um, on the southwest here, we have the, um, the Oromo and Somali area, where generation and age um, were the organizing principle, and where there wasn't any um, single authority. All complementary. Um, in the Borana case, uh, we might know, and the neighboring peoples around here in Sigamo, Gedeo, and uh, lower pastoralist areas of Let Stephanie and the Omo River, we have generation, generational systems where single authority does not really mean much. Or if there were some individual um, uh, in people who, who, individuals who saw themselves as um, the royals, they, their power was complemented with a generational authority and it was checked, not just um, let loose. So it was a complex political system, but what the if, uh, royal Ethiopian authorities in Central Menelik have done is to accept local authority the way they were formed <coughs> and then mobilize the whole population, keeping their peculiarities and administrative, uh, traditional administrative system. Most of the royals here in Wolaita, Kaffa, uh, and the lowlands here, um, I'll, I'll take five cases to explain how they were organized, just to give you a flavor of how uh, royal manner. But in some cases, they would go out of their way, but assemblies would uh, eject them and replace them with younger brothers or other close relatives who are in fact, to, to those positions. So this was a, a complementary kind of arrangement, but the Ethiopian royal tradition did not kind of try to homogenize this system. If homogenized, then it would create a mess, I would imagine, um, as, it, as it has happened after the fall of the Ethiopian um, central, um, uh, the Ethiopian crown. Uh, what happened until the end of the period, was everywhere we had these systems that operated in their unique ways and were had the upper hand regarding their um, resources, <coughs> land and agricultural systems, and um, there were, of course, services to the central <coughs> government where loyalty was expected from these, 
blood taxes and other things were managed uh, by uh, the royals, local royals, and plus uh, soldiers of the former imperial army who were, were part of the incorporation of the, the wider Ethiopian territory. So they worked in tandem with local royals, and local royals mediating between power and the center, local power. Um, so that more or less harmonized, there was resistance, of course, during the initial incorporation, and that was handled differently. Places like Wolaga uh, surrendered peacefully, so their people were handled in an exceptionally nice way by the center because they were not subjugated under the Gambar system. There was, uh, there was marriage uh, with the Wolaga royal family, and that produced, uh, I think, probably Casa is the product of that. Uh, I think the imperial um, princess Tenanya's uh, daughters got married to the Jasmat Casa. And so, anyway, uh, the Roma and others just imagine and believe the crown belongs to them too. Because, and there are other interesting things also in addition to intermarriage. The local royals were given dukes and governors from the palace. Um, and I, for one, remember um, Prince Haile Selassie, the father of the current Prince Hermias, being the governor of the Mugofa. And the hard duke of Hara, Lul Makonen, was the uh, point of the duke. So this uh, was complementary again, but uh, keeping uh, local tradition, autonomy of local traditions. I think this would give you a sense that there is or not, there hasn't been only one crown in the center, but there were many royalties that kind of um, cared for each other, and, and not only cared, but put the country in, in order. And the prison for the defeat of the Italians was everybody at their stake. Every group had their, their things celebrated by their rulers, had their land and resources managed by their own uh, uh, royals, and when this was at stake, it was easy for Ethiopian leaders to mobilize the population, unlike, um, that, uh, unlike things that have happened afterwards. Thank you very much. Dr. Wendy James, to carry on in terms of reflecting on more on the kinds of research that is uh, kept digging up you know more about the diversities of uh, Ethiopia and the different communities. Welcome and thank you very much. Well, it was a wonderful gathering we had this morning and the rest of today. I'm very pleased uh, to have this chance to be honored to speak in this particular context. I'm not really talking about the royal level of things in Ethiopia, and um, <clears throat> nor am I going to talk about the ways in which most Western understandings of Ethiopia as a country uh, have seen it as so, so very special. It's seen as a unique place, very much so, even within Ethiopia, uh, within African studies uh, circles. Uh, it's seen as unique, not only in itself, but because of the Caribbean roots of the Rastafarian movement, which was mentioned earlier, or the international understanding of the acceptance of the Kalasha as Ethiopian Jews in Israel. Everything Ethiopian is, is very special in most Western uh, and possibly Far Eastern understandings in the country. Uh, my 15 minutes will simply point to some contributions that scholarship and research exchanges between the UK and Ethiopia since the 1950s have made to modern uh, understandings of the history and culture of the country and the to the ways in which these are embedded in improved understandings of the interconnections between the countries of the Northeast African region as a whole. These patterns cannot be explained in terms of any standard critique of colonialism, colonial history, colonial anthropology, as is so common elsewhere in the world. Even the other major country of the Northeast African region, that is Sudan, 
you know, divided, of course, but <coughs> in the old days, it was a very complicated colonial situation of a condominium uh, between England, uh, Britain, and Egypt, Anglo-Egyptian condominium. Uh, it was not a straight colony of Britain and France, uh, as in the case of so many other areas within which modern African studies um, interdisciplinary, uh, in whatever sense, uh, has, has run on. Now, in many academic setting, settings in this country since the 1950s, the Sudan did not fall automatically either into programs or publications dealing with African studies. But in the case of my own move from geography here in this university as an undergraduate to social anthropology as a graduate student, it took pride of place, the Sudan, largely, largely through the sustained work of Professor Edward Evans Pritchard from the late 1920s, mainly in the Sudan, but involving at least three neighboring countries, two now. He was appointed to the Chair of Social Anthropology here in Oxford from 1946. Various uh, students of his and his younger colleagues took forward the tradition of research in the Sudan and supported the new Department of Anthropology and Sociology founded in Khartoum University in 1958. My own appointment there in the 1960s enabled me to do field research in the hills of the Upper Blue Nile, close to the Ethiopian border. <coughs> we complete this. And you can see, over the 15 years, you can see immediately that a good quarter of the papers given uh, were devoted to the Ethiopian area, the Ethiopian train, or its, its borderlands, stuck on the border, or what So, <coughs> I am uh, um, working on putting this together and when it's uh, uh, complete and uh, when I've had time to analyze it a little more, um, I will make it available. So thank you very much. It's my great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Patrick Mogwabi. Sorry if I'm yeah. Oh, I made it. Okay. <laughs> Who will tell us a little bit about a very early expedition from uh, from here? So over to you. Thank you. And then we'll have tea for those who are yeah. desperate. <laughs> well, thank you so much, and thank you for inviting me. And uh, I, I feel that just stepping in the footsteps of this learned discourse on, on what Oxford has done uh, with Ethiopia and in Ethiopia and Ethiopians in Oxford, um, what we did was kind of a different order, but <coughs> this month is the 50th anniversary of the four of us returning from Gemogofa, where we conducted a socio-economic and biodiversity survey under the tutelage of Margaret Haswell, if anyone knows of her, uh, and um, and uh, and uh, Mr. Mr. Monda, uh, who were both in the Agricultural Economics Institute at the time, and um, and our purpose was basically to collect data for them, but for us, it was the formation, so we used the perfect <coughs> of an epiphany. An epiphany that having studied agriculture and related subjects in, in the university here, which is pushing us ever towards the labour reducing, chemically intensive type of green revolution farming, presuming this is the best thing for the rest of the world, to go to Ethiopia and particularly to the Highlands to find this vibrant, highly productive, in fact, the most food productive uh, uh, part of, of, of Africa, which had existed for, for decades, for millennia, and was still being able to sustain itself, was an absolute eye-opener. And I guess that was the moment 
that was the light bulb moment, the epiphany, which meant that I continued to do the kind of stuff uh, that I do today, which is all to do with agriculture, environment, biodiversity, food sovereignty. I'm going to race through a few images. I have them on, on, on a machine, and we can look at them more, more leisurely later if anybody wants to. That's a few more. Which I found buried in my attic from 50 years ago. So forgive the quality. We went to Yemen Gopher, and you all know where it is. And importantly, what we were surveying was the transect across from Arbaminch up to Mount Tola and down to Mali in the, the Rift Valley on the far side. And recall at that time, Arbaminch had only just been formed as, as, a, as a center. Chencha was still very important uh, as, the, uh, as the administrative center of, of Gemgulfa. And this area here, in the Rift Valley, was wild animals. This is where the lions roam. This is where I nearly had my encounter, my last encounter, uh, in, in the field when walking by a, by a little brook, I saw this very large pug mark with the water flowing in. It was an important story, I'll tell you about it later. Right. And we went as arrogant young, uh, uh, young students, Richard Jackson, uh, John Foster, Tim Russell, our team leader, and myself, um, out to see the world. And how were we able to do so? We were able to do so because of the excellent relations that the university had forged with Ethiopia coming through, through Hartsville. And the doors were opened wide everywhere. And then, as I was saying earlier, it is absolutely the center of the food economy, the thing that gave the calories, and became the, also it was the center of this very biodiverse landscape with lots of different kinds of food crops, many varieties. Of then set alone in one community, I think we counted 48 cultivars, different types of, 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 of insects, nurtured in sacred groves. It's a beautiful system, wonderfully organized. And the harvesting of insects was a, an amazement to us. The whole process all the way through to scraping the fibers off and, and, and collecting the food. The rest of the farming, uh, barley was, was, of course, very important, uh, endemic, and, 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 and uh, uh, in, in many cases, varieties uh, originating in, in Ethiopia. Um, suitable instruments to be able to till the soil, to clean the soil, but not to overturn it, not to, not to destroy the top soil, to keep the fertility in the top of the soil. Winnowing, uh, threshing and winnowing the, the, the crop. Handing uh, and distilling and enjoying the products of, of that distillation. <laughs> of course, alongside of all that, and what sort of made cash money were various industries. And I remember uh, Walter the Exhibit, who some of you may know, uh, he used to call him the godfather of the biosafety protocol and the Convention on Biological Diversity. Twald in his wonderful wife Sue Edwards, who did the flora uh, of Ethiopia. Twald used to say, what we need is a sustainable, rural industrialization, something that keeps jobs and people in the countryside. And this was one example where the Dorsey Weavers, who had a big community of course in Addis, uh, would do quite a lot of the work here, finishing in Addis and selling, selling the products. The other feature of, of, the, of the agronomy of the food system was that livestock were integrated. And, and one of the ways in which that was dealt with was that the halaka would declare certain areas open for grazing and certain areas being closed. And that local governance of the way in which land was used meant that none was overexploited, 
None of it was uh, led to overgrazing and the destruction of the soil and, and, and erosion and so forth. That sense of local control, and that may not be perfect in every way, but that sense of local control was what kept the system going and made and, and ensured that that uh, uh, agricultural system uh, what was, was the same. <coughs> the, um, oh, this is just a little, little something. It, it, um, it, amused, uh, it amuses some people nowadays to, 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 to know that these were important gardens. This is an important rain shelter. And when we'd done our business and collected all the data and met many wonderful people, having walked up the mountain to Chensha, we rode down in the inaugural bus service from Chensha <laughs> to Arba Minch. And via Northern Ethiopia, Axum, returning with the Blue Nile ex expedition plane back to, back to the UK with our treasures of, of pirated, bio-pirated barley and insect plants. I, I, I dread to say it. No prior informed consent then, um, but um, <coughs> gratefully received by Kew Gardens uh, and, and here in, in the Oxford uh, Botanical Garden. Um, arrived eventually uh, in uh, Kingston Road uh, and uh, on the number three bus, I think it was. <laughs> yeah, number three bus. Um, lots of writing up, and we produced um, um, a hefty sort of report which uh, somebody tells me is in one of the libraries here in, in, the, Radcliffe in, in Science the Radcliffe Science Library. Mm -hmm. It's actually full of good data. It's full it. of good data. <laughs> the other day. And it gives you a real good picture of how things were in those days. Um, and I, I contributed a lot in the data collection, a lot in the writing up. Annex, six, uh, uh, Annex uh, C uh, talks about the, the different economic plants which are grown across the, the profile. And, uh, ah, and as I say, it was, it was a, a, a wonderful, wonderful experience. Let me just describe the, the cafe potato, as some people call it. The Irish potato, which is grown in, in that region, four, particularly four varieties, one of which was a beautiful red skin variety, which is called Ferengi in <laughs> <laughs> Serendipitously met up with with Tedesco, and um, uh, I was going to a, a meeting of the, the International uh, Sea Treaty in Ethiopia, and I met up with, with you, and you put me in touch with one of your colleagues at the Christensen Fund, Nathaniel, and uh, we had the opportunity to go back to Arbaninj and to Chencha and further beyond. And in fact, found bus service had not only reached Chencha, but is now well within the highlands. I think it's out of town or somewhere like that. And, and it was a fire. In the intervening 40 years, so much had happened. You know more about it than I do, but so much had happened. For me, the lowest point was in about 86, when the sixth form of Chencha College was removed to receive lead in the battles. It was a, a dreadful, a dreadful period. So much pressure put on, on the community. And by 2010, as well you know, there was a whole, whole set of pressure on local institutions, on local leaders, on halakas, disrupting that very system which had maintained and sustained the food system for so many hundreds, if not thousands, of years. The Christian sects who were deliberately building their temples on the sacred sites, undermining the way in which people were being able to, to keep uh, religion, but also the biodiversity, the sacred heroes uh, alive, forcing people to take on industrial seeds and abandon the diverse local seeds forcing people to, to use uh, um, dif different uh, uh, to, to, to 
forcing people to, to, to use um, uh, fertilizers. Urea. Disrupting the fertility of, 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 of the soil. Moving from producing useful goods, socially useful goods, to producing tourist towns. Three G network right through the whole area. A Chinese, I mean, massive, massive change. But all that said, the production system, the anaesthetic culture, the diverse food production system, locally managed, locally controlled by one means or another. <coughs> still survived, probably 2010. Hopefully it still survives today. For this university to think about how it can help maintain such productive, biodiverse food systems modeled on what exists in Gambia. Instead of land grabs, industrial agriculture, displacement of peasants, creation of massive poor housing areas in cities with, the, with the, the children of the displaced. Isn't it time for there to be a, a renewal of interest in how to support food sovereignty, how to support a biodiverse food system? And I just leave that hanging in the air. Some of you will know about Oxford Real Farming Conference that happens each year in the in, in, in the, uh, uh, the, the beginning of January to, to counter the, the Oxford Farming Conference. Those sorts of things get talked about there. But Oxford, I think, has the possibility to be able to do something very meaningful to reawaken and reaffirm that rather than pushing down the genomic green, new green revolution. Uh, uh, I'd like to finish just with another very couple of serendipitous links to um, <coughs> His Imperial Majesty. My, my wife was a teenager when he appeared on Grand Nation Day in April 1966 in Jamaica. And as you well know, 100,000 people mobbed him on the tarmac and surrounded his plane. But before that, in 1937, he, his son was a pupil at King's School, Taunton. And my dad was a junior teacher, first job after leaving Christchurch, at the school. And one of his little side jobs had been to plant up the estate with the trees from Albury Men. And his job was to find the coronation oak and prepare the whole for his imperial majesty to plant the coronation tree in 1937. <laughs> <Not just. laughs>